Hey everyone and welcome to chapter 17 selection and evolution. There are three parts in this chapter. Number one is variation, number two is natural selection, number three is evolution. Now in this part, in the first part called variation, we will be learning how um, the phenotype results from an interaction of a genotype and environment, how variation has different types and how the environment influences the phenotype. Okay, later on in uh, next week, we will be learning uh, t-tests and statistics stuff. So let's just look at variation now. Now, what is variation? Variation is the presence of different characteristics. Okay, and characteristics are also known as phenotype. Phenotype results from an interaction of genotype and environment. Now, if you phrase this differently uh, and maybe say write it as a formula it will look like this so phenotypic variation is actually equivalent to the genetic variation and the environmental variation so phenotypic variation is a result of what is different in your genes and what is what different environments you are exposed to so this is a simplified version of that long equation there vp equals to vg and ve p referring to phenotypic, G referring to genetic, and E referring to environmental variation. To be honest, it doesn't have much uh, applications at the moment, maybe more in your undergrad degree. Anyways, back to variation. Variation, again, is the presence of different characteristics. And there are actually two types of variation. Number one is continuous variation, and number two is Co discontinuous variation okay one discontinuous one is continuous okay so let's see how they differ now in this continuous variation it shows a discontinuous distribution so it's often uh, the trait the phenotype is often represented by like a little bar chart like this and this is because only one or a few genes are controlling the phenotype actually all the examples we have learned in chapter six they are all almost all of them no, definitely all of them are discontinuously distributed. They all can be um, shown and represented like a bar chart like this. Okay, the, this different alleles at single gene locus have large effects on the phenotype. Different genes will have different effects. Okay, think of different alleles. The type of data here is qualitative because it's in distinct categories. It has no intermediates. The effect of the environment is little or none here. It's almost always fully determined by these few genes. As I said, they have a large effect on the phenotype. The examples here are all very familiar to you, should be familiar to you. Um, and we have learned all of them here. Albinisms, SCA, hemophilia, and HD. Okay, so all, all the while we've been learning discontinuous traits. But... There's also something called continuous variation. Continuous variation is when a trait, it can be represented by a normal distribution, a little bell curve here. Now, the bell curve, okay, is formed because the trait is coded for by many genes. It is a polygenic trait or polygenic phenotype. Each of these genes have a small effect. But because there are so many genes, they all add up. So we say that the genes have an additive effect. It is usually quantitative data. Okay, It results in a range of phenotypes and many intermediates. And to add on to that, the environment has, the environment has an effect on the trait. So this helps smooth out the curve um, and result in a bell curve, a normal distribution like this. Okay, so it's not... A, A, B, B, or O is not distinct categories, but instead something like height or mass would have maybe this average height is what? 177 cm, okay? But you can have 177.1, 177.01, one. okay? You have all these little intermediates in between that are included in the curve. So yeah, that's continuous variation versus discontinuous variation. Okay, moving back to the sentence. Remember what it says, phenotype results from the interaction of genotype and environment. And therefore, okay, as we saw just now, phenotype varies. There are different types of phenotypes because there are different genotypes and different environments. So let's quickly talk about the different gen genotype. Okay, so this is genetic variation. 
The main source of genetic variation is number one, meiosis and fertilization. This is what is familiar to you. Okay, if you don't remember this, refer to chapter 16. Um, but just a quick snapshot, it's due to crossing over at prophase 1, independent absorbment at metaphase 1, and random fertilization or mating. But you realize here that there are no new alleles being introduced, you're just shuffling alleles in the gametes. So resulting in different gametes and resulting in offspring that may not look exactly the same as their parents. They are a mix, a blend of both their parents. Um, what is the primary source of variation? It's actually mutation, which is very interesting because we always think about mutation as if it's a bad thing. But actually not all mutations are deleterious or disadvantageous, right? Some of them would result in new allele that might be advantageous to the species. In fact, all new alleles okay, are a result of mutation. All alleles are a result of mutations for millions of years. So yeah, main source genetic variation again, number one, meiosis and fertilization, but just, just shuffles the genes in the offsprings. Okay, but, number, but the primary source of variation here, again, is mutations because it results in new alleles. So that's genetic uh, variation. Now, let's talk about how the environment can influence phenotype. So environmental variation. So these are environmental factors can influence phenotypes. Okay, it's sort of common sense, but here's a few examples. Nutrients and diet can influence phenotypes, especially like um, weight and health. Right, water availability if you're plant, human also actually, light intensity if you're a plant, disease or parasites, temperature. These are all things in the environment that can influence phenotypes and even lifestyle and culture can influence phenotype for human beings. IQ, for example. Again, the environmental effect has a greater um, is usually greater on polygenes or traits coded for by poly multiple genes that's what polygenes mean again polygenes is many genes controlling one trait i forgot that was here great and therefore um phenotype that's affected by environment often show continuous variation okay so we we just learned what the environment can have what differences in environment can have to influence phenotype but how exactly does the environment influence phenotype? How, what does it change? So the environment may change a few things. Number one, it may limit or modify gene expression. For example, um, when it comes to size, mass or height, or it can trigger or switch on certain genes. Now we're gonna learn a few examples in a moment, including all of these. Um, but there's one more way it can, it can influence phenotype. The environment may also induce mutation, which affects phenotype and obviously result in a new allele. Okay, let's go through some of these examples on how environment can influence phenotype. So, the environment may trigger or switch on genes and these are some examples, right? So, this is a very cute Himalayan rabbit. Do you know if you rear them at temperatures above 30 C, like in Malaysia, they will be all white? But if you read it, maybe in an aircon room, 20 degrees or less, they would form this uh, black ears and black nose and black feet and black little hands. Here, black limbs, like, essentially. So, why is that? Now, that's because the dark pigmentation is controlled by both genotype and environment. At low temperature, the allele for this dark pigment is expressed forming dark tips at ears, paws, nose, tail. Now, um, a separate e experiment has been done as well. Uh, what they did was they took some fur off, shaved some fur off this rabbit right here. Very cute. <laughs> and then they put an ice pack on it. And miraculously, after they take it off, we realized that, hey, black fur has grown in the place of this little ice pack. This shows that Okay, the allele for dark pigment is expressed at low temperatures. So that is the rabbits. Let's talk about high temperature and how it can affect gender in crops. How crazy is that? Do you know that the gender of crocodiles depends on the temperature of eggs, the incubation temperature? So imagine them uh, laying eggs in the sand, right? And some eggs are on the top there 
and the eggs on the top might be more exposed to the sun, so they might be hotter. The eggs in the middle may be slightly cooler, and the eggs at the furthest away from the sun would be the least uh, warm, so it's the coldest. And actually, this really really um, affects the gender. So temperature of 32 to 34 would be males, and anything below that or above that would be female. So you would expect the top will be females, the middle will be males, and then the bottom will be females. Crazy, right? So, um, yeah, that is Crocs. Now, in other news, curly wing appearances in Drosophila is also affected by high temperatures. In fruit flies with a curly wing mutation, a temperature of 19 degrees will cause them to have straight wings. So they have that gene, they have the curly wing mutation alle mutated allele, but they will still have straight wings at low temperatures. At a little bit higher temperature, 25 degrees, this results in curly wings. So the curly wing allele is only expressed when the temperature is higher, a little bit higher at 25 degrees. All right, next, I think would be more, um, this would be more like relevant to you, I suppose. Okay, um, you realize that after a few hours of exposure to sunlight, you get more tan, right? So what happens actually? So after a few hours of exposure to UV radiation, your melanocytes, which are in your skin layer, produce melanin causing skin to tan, to form dark spots or freckles. And actually, this is a protective mechanism. I know Asians don't really like to be tan, but actually, this is your body protecting itself from D DNA damage. And this tanning effect is actually good for you. <laughs> it protects it, okay? Because uh, UV radiation, as we know, is, is a mutagen and can mutate uh, cells. Uh, sorry, mutate DNA. So with cells with uh, darker appearances, right, UV rays can be reflected and cannot penetrate as deep into the skin. Last but not least, I think this makes common this is common sense as well, is a wavelength of wavelength of light and plant growth. Now wavelength of light, alright, it makes sense that red and blue light are most effective because you can see here that Blue is very highly absorbed, and red is very highly absorbed as well, and green is mostly reflected. So red and blue lights are most effective for plant growth. Now, there's so many journals out there that tell us that a blue light is maybe helpful in seed germination, and red light maybe help flowers bloom, but leaves might have a stretched and elongated appearance instead. This is this uh this is experiments where they only breed the plant in only red light. And many, it's confusing actually the amount of information there. I haven't dug it very much, but you don't need to know in detail. You just need to know, hey, look, different wavelengths of light would be able to stimulate plant growth differently. Yep. So, what have we learned so far? Number one, phenotype is determined by the genotype and the environment. The environment influences phenotype by limiting or modifying gene expression, it can trigger or switch on genes, and it can induce mutations with effect phenotype. How about genetics? How does genetics influence the phenotype? Now genetics obviously code genes obviously code for proteins and proteins will be able to influence phenotype. Their main source of genetic variations, number one, meiosis and fertilization, and number two is mutations. And that's it for this particular part. Very short, very sweet. And yep, I'll see you next video. Bye!